Waalaikum salam. Waalaikum salam. How's everybody doing? Assalamu alaikum everybody who's just joining. How are you guys? Good, how are you? Good, alhamdulillah. Good, alhamdulillah. I see some familiar faces and a lot of new faces. We'll wait another minute and then we'll kick off, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Shalom. Waalaikum. Waalaikum assalam. Hello. Salam. Oh wait. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam. Waalaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam. Waalaikum assalam. How are you guys? Alhamdulillah. Wait, you can do funky backgrounds? Yeah. Why did I clean my room? I didn't have to. You didn't get the memo? I took this picture when I was in Utah. Wait, how do you change the background? Let me let me do this. Okay, like right next to the stop video, there's an arrow. And you can hit that and choose virtual background. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is where I would like to be, Bryce Canyon National Park. <laughs> Hold on a second, how is it working? Assalamu alaikum everybody who's just joined. How are you guys? Hello? Hello. Hi. Hey, assalamu alaikum. I'm glad, I'm glad you guys have videos turned on. I thought I would, I would be the only person with video and then I would be listening to just, just voices. Alhamdulillah, okay, good. We've got, we've got more than, we've got more than 30 people, so it's going to be a little bit crowded, but I think inshallah we can manage it. Is this the largest Zoom use you guys have had this lockdown? No. You've had bigger? Had, yeah, with like 50 people. Wow. <laughs> but that was like for work, so. No, work, work doesn't count. Oh, okay, then no. Hi, Alex. Hi. Big fan. Hi, guys. Let's see. So do you guys all know each other? I'm just kidding. No. No. <laughs> I've never seen you guys. <laughs> I won't do the because I think you do the introductions. We'll be sitting here for a while. So, if you guys have your teas and coffees ready, I think we can start. Uh, on this side of the world, I can have tea. Yet. I'm still fasting. <laughs> uh, so we've got. So inshallah, we can we can start. Hi everybody. Salam. Um, so we've got people from all over the world. I know some of you guys, and some of you guys I don't know. 
but I this is the reason I asked for the location in the form was I wanted to see where everyone is joining from because I think it gives a interesting flavor to the conversation if we know roughly the geographic location of you guys. So we've got people from Pakistan to India to Malaysia to the US, Canada, South America, Middle East. I see someone from Lebanon. Um, did I miss anything? What's the most obscure place someone is from? I'm from um, Austria. I don't know if that's obscure. Austria, yeah. It's, it's, that's, yeah. That's, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for joining. So this is this is the first of probably more that I'll do. And I and I wanted to do this for a few reasons. One is I think it's a good time to talk. I think everybody's um listening in listening mode and learning mode. And I did a session like this for, for a group of students a week ago, and they really enjoyed the conversations outside of Instagram. I think to be able to ask and challenge, I think it's an interesting way of doing this because often when I talk about Orientalism or photography, I, I don't typically get debate because people don't really know how to have that platform to engage on because how do you challenge somebody without, you know, having done some research and, and, and I guess, text is not really a good way to talk, this misunderstanding. So I thought we could do this, we could have some debate, and we can see, we can see whether what I say on Instagram is basically just rubbish, and I'm, and I'm, just, and I'm just pushing my own view. Um, I'm gonna mute all of you guys until I open up questions so we don't have background noise. So today the topic is Orientalism. So you, some of you guys probably know what Orientalism is. If you follow me, I typically talk about it in the space of travel photography. And some of you may not know too much about Orientalism. So to kick off, I'm just gonna do a quick summary of what, what Orientalism is and how it's defined from an academic perspective. And then we can bring it into contemporary culture and travel photography and what's currently happening in the world and how that's being, how that's being portrayed with the lens of Orientalism in a, in a more journalistic way, which is something that I was covering yesterday and I try to do every week now just to make sense of the news and how to understand what's going on. So, so, so Edward Said wrote this book, Orientalism in 1978. And he really, I'm not sure if he coined the term, but he really popularized it as a, as a way of understanding how the West sees the East. And, um, and what Karl Marx said in, in one of his books is, they cannot represent themselves, so they must be represented. And essentially this is the, the crux of Orientalism is, representing somebody else who you don't think are qualified to represent themselves. This is more of an exercise in self-affirmation, Edward Said says, than an objective study of somebody else. So typically when you have history books, you have sociology books from the last 200 years, people, Western, Western academics would travel to the East and they would describe the people and, and they would act as if this is a very systemized methodical study of a people, of a nation or a history. And, and Edward Said argued, really, it's not, it's not really a systematic scientific study. It's more an act of self-identification and affirmation of who you are. And the reason you do this is to, to really define the other person as a polar opposite for who you are. So Edward Said says, on the one hand, there are Westerners. And on the other hand, there are Orientals. The former, meaning us, and the Westerners are rational, peaceful, liberal, logical, and capable of holding real values, whether that's in religion, uh, moral values, ethical values, without natural suspicion. And the latter, meaning the, the East and the, the natives, they're not capable of any of those things. So, so these values of being, being defined as, as a native or an Orient has really, as Edward Said would argue, really become part of the institutions of Western academia culture and so this goes into this goes into literature i mean it goes into social identity it goes into everything and and the reason this is interesting for us today is this is not just an old historic study of a jane austen or joseph conrad or kipling the the interesting part of this is although we can argue the empire is ended and the time of the the colonial rule is over in many ways these institutions haven't really changed too much the structure and the learning framework that was used to educate back then hasn't really changed too much even to today. We still use sources and, and the Western system of education is still very much um, leading towards the old Victorian system, at least in, in, in the UK and France. So this is why I think it's important today. So 
So what does Orientalism really mean in a more, let's, let's just bullet point this and you guys can ask questions in a few seconds when I finish this before we go deep dive into something more detailed. So you can create the identity of the Orient, that's number one. You're, you're defining the other person. You create the story and the narrative and how they came into existence. You write about their history, the past, and what they've achieved in that history. So when Napoleon conquered Egypt in 1798, he took with him an army of academics and sociologists and scientists, and, and this was really to study the Egyptians. You would you be surprised because when you conquer a country, typically you know you go with your navy um, and your military and you conquer them. So what Napoleon, Napoleon started doing was before he planned the conquest of Egypt, he spent a couple of years studying the Egyptians using existing Orientalist in, uh, literature because he was a very smart man. He wanted to really as today we call it winning the hearts and minds, you know, when the Americans invaded Iraq, the whole idea was you win the hearts. And, and that's, and that's a, essentially it's the same thing. You study them, you know what their weaknesses are, what their love is, what their language is. I think he even tried to study Arabic. Napoleon read the Quran, he's commented on the Quran. And growing up, when I would read a quote by Napoleon on the Quran, and it was in Napoleon Bonaparte, and I would think, oh, this is so cool. Napoleon spoke about my religion. And I felt really validated because there was this great military leader talking about Islam. But the reason he talked about the Quran was because he was studying it as a part of his conquest plans for, for Egypt and Syria. So when Napoleon did conquer Egypt, they, they spent a couple of years mapping the entire landscape, the history and the culture, the language, and they came back with commentaries, they came back with books and volumes of books in French. And, and the people in, in France who couldn't go to Egypt they read them and they were blown away because this is for the first time you have this really European system, systematic study of the native and, and the English read them and the English were like outraged. How could Napoleon do this? We haven't done this yet. So really French, the French kicked off by formalizing Orientalism in this way. And then the French, the German, the Portuguese started doing the same things in Africa and, and Asia. So this is, this was the, if you like the beginning of a formal study of of the native and native, when I say native, I just mean in an ironic way. I don't really think many of us are natives by that sense. Um, so, the, so the modern, so, so that's essentially how I'll, I'll end that there because I think you can really go into this and uh, and keep talking about this. And I can't talk about this for a while. So I'll, I'll meet you guys, unmute you guys before we dig into the modern version of Orientalism. Do you guys want to ask any questions on back of what I just said? Does it make sense? Okay. I think for me personally, it like one of the things that I wanted to learn about today is how to better talk about Orientalism with those who aren't familiar with the concept of it. Um, you know, that's kind of just like a prefacing question that I wanted to throw out there. That's a good question. Yeah, we'll we'll come to that. Okay. Is there any, anything else? Um, Go I on. have one. Um, I actually don't really know lots about Orientalism because it wasn't something that I grew up with because it, it's some, as I approaching 20, it's something that I just learn off because I came from Indonesia and it's not something that is most talked about. So it's kind of new. To, for me. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other yeah, questions? Just, these are really good questions. I'll answer these in a second. Ethan, I think you had a question, right? Yeah, I live in the rural US. So I know nothing about Orient Orientalism. I'm just a, like a passive observer trying to learn about this stuff. Okay. Um, something. Uh, I have a question. Okay, Anna, go. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could also kind of draw the links between um, power and knowledge and how these representations are used um, as a form of power, because I think that would kind of also highlight contemporary um, representations, like I'm thinking in the case of India and Kashmir, where mm -hmm. the race aspect of it or the concept of a foreigner is not there, but at the same time, the representation is of similar um, yeah, oriented so the, so the Okay. And the outcomes okay alex did you have a question oh i just wanted to have a better understanding of where you draw the line but or like how you define 
Orientalism versus colonialism versus imperialism. Like what, how do they interact and where does one start and the other lens, I guess. Not end. Yeah, okay. Before I take more, I'll try and answer this. So if one by one, if I miss one, remind me. So one of the critiques, one of the questions you guys didn't ask me was, what's the, what's the critique of orientalism? Because it sounds like a very anti-Western way of thinking about things. Um, so a lot of Western academics came out and uh, I'm going to meet all of you guys. And, and they said, this is essentially just anti-Westernism. This isn't, this isn't more to it. All he's saying is, all the literature we have ever written about the East is racist. This is essentially what Edward Said was saying, according to these people. Um, and so the question about Indonesia is an interesting one, because one of the critiques of the book, Orientalism, was Edward Said focused on a very small amount, amount of time to talk and take examples. So he didn't go a, into Japan. He didn't go into Far East. And he didn't look at, for example, the, the exploration of Japan by, by, by the Europeans wasn't about colonization. It was just, just to explore and understand the Japanese culture. So the, crit, the, crit, the critic said, what he's done is he selectively picked a hand full of examples in periods and time. And he said, look, this is what they're doing. So, so the, criti the criticism is, are you being anti-Western? Are you defining colonialism as Alex said, or are you just trying to I guess understand a, a phenomenon which which really wasn't articulated very well until Edward Said came along. So, so is it is it colonialism or is it are you defining colonialism or are you defining before that? Well, I think it goes I think it goes hand in hand in, in some respects because the whole point of subjugating a people, for example, in India, which is what Edward Said didn't really talk too much about, nor did he talk about South America, was was the tools of colonialism and how do you how do you suppress a people or how do you subjectify people successfully? Um, consistently and persistently without without losing control and 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 there's a whole chain of thought around how you do that and so the art the idea of creating a slave and a master culture was brought on by this whole expedition of napoleon was if you can understand them then you can win their hearts and minds you can convince them you're there to really educate them to civilize them and to essentially elevate them so when when napoleon went to to egypt and he saw that it was, there was a strong Ottoman. So he defeated the Ottomans to take over Egypt, right? And so he said, you guys are Arabs. Why do you have, why do you have the Ottomans ruling over you? This doesn't make any sense. You guys are, you guys are you know, the, the cradle of the Middle East. You should be independent. So this is the beginning of planting a seed that you're better than someone else, but you're using a, a, a tactic of Orientalism, which is saying, uh, which is what you've done is you've understood them, you've understood the grievances, and now you've used it, use it against them. So falsely, you've convinced them they're better than the Ottomans, you can kick them out. Arabic should be a language, not any kind of Ottoman influence, Turkish or anything like that, or the architecture. So they go to the, the Ottomans, and then by that time, what he'd done is he understood Islam, he understood how important faith was to these people. So what he did was he left, he left the Imams and certain religious clerics in positions of power in, the, in Cairo, but he really did their own strings. So this was his way of, of controlling these people. So this is essentially a step-by-step -step into colonizing the people is you really understand what, how they tick. And so he understood you don't just go with an army and you, can, and you can control them for hundreds of years. You really, really have to plant foundations of, um, and this is what the British did in India, right? They understood, they went in when, when, when the Mughals were at the weakest, they understood there were divisions between um, the different factions in India. And so they went in the exact same tactic. You understood the grievances, the language, the culture, the religion. You had the Sikhs against the Hindus, Hindus against the Muslims. So this study, this formalizing, formalization of Orientalism was really not, as Edward Said argued, to understand the people, is to A, define them, self-affirm your own identity, and then as a result, you can win over them um, without having much military might, because you can argue, how on earth could the British, this tiny island, control almost the entire world. And this is how they did it. It was a very, very systematic way of understanding the, the person you're going to control essentially. Um, the question around Indonesia and why you haven't felt it. Um, I think the French, it was a French colony, right? Am I right? Indonesia at one point. So this, this really, really depends on how your own post, post-colonial education system is in your own world. Um, but in reality, you're being impacted by this without even understanding it. So your entire curriculum, and I'm guessing in Indonesia is the same as is in most Middle East countries and Asia, is back is based on either the British system or the French system. That directly itself is a result of Orientalism, because what you've done is once you had independent from the French and the Americans in Indonesia, 
you, you said, well, we can't go back to the, the days before that. We have to continue as a Dutch colony. My apologies. You, you can't go back to your own way of thinking. You have to, you have to stick with the, the French curriculum or the English system. And now you're studying the way they study. You specialize in a specific field. You start learning French or English um, or German or whatever it is. So really it's, it's A, that has consequences you haven't really thought about, but in terms of hearing about it, yeah, a lot of people don't really know what it is because it's for a long time it's become, it's, it's been a very academic study and it stayed within the phrase of the academia world. And I decided never brought this into the photography world, travel photography, which is something he, he died in 2003. So this, you know, he never, he never criticized National Geographic or stuff like that. He kept it really on a very niche level. And I think that's something that's been, that's been tried to be, I think it's expanded, but not, not really successfully. And I think that's probably one of the reasons. So Ethan, to your question about, uh, you're learning about it. Hopefully that answers some of those questions around what Orientalism is. So it's a study really um, of the phenomenon of defining somebody else to A, define yourself, and B, to, uh, to turn them into tables and rows and columns in a, in a, as if it's a specimen in a laboratory. And, and really this is, this is how the objectification happens. Um, because if you, if, you, if you are a people defined in this book, this is how they see you. Your, your richness is defined by the thickness of this book. And that's essentially all the French knew about the Egyptian was when they came back with, with the volumes. There wasn't much effort to study the richness, which looks, this is a funny story. So when Napoleon went to Cairo, right? They couldn't believe how mad the city was. There's no grid system like, like in Paris. You don't have the nice um, rows and, you know, um, you, you just, you couldn't, you, you get lost. If you go to Morocco and Fez or you go to Lahore, you go to anywhere. Napoleon couldn't, Napoleon couldn't understand. And so, so they defined them, but they really, um, they, they called out everybody and said, these people are crazy. How are they surviving? How have they survived a thousand years without any uh, running water, which is controlled from a central irrigation system? How could they have six gates, which, which you can't really get, you know, he couldn't understand how these people lived. And this, and this is the beginning of, of saying, okay, they're wrong. Let's teach them how to do it. So what Napoleon did was, if you go to Cairo today, there's a, there's a, there's a new Cairo, right? Which, is, which looks like you're in Paris. So they destroyed part of old Cairo and then they started building a new Cairo, which was based on Paris design. And I mean, this is how, we're, this is where our officers will live. This is where our academics will live, but we'll go into your old city to study you and then we'll come out again if we survive it. They destroyed all the walls around Cairo. They destroyed most of the, the gates around Cairo because they were worried that this, is, this, this would cause resistance and they could, they could mount, you know, like a resurgence or something. So, so this was really a way to, um, um, imagine, imagine them through you. So you started, you know, to teach them to, to be civilized. And really, this is this is essentially what the experience has been in most of, most most colonial countries or post-colonial countries, or feeling like you're not as good as as the people you've been colonized by. Um, and that's a legacy, really. I think in most of the world, um, we define ourselves using a reflection of of the West. We don't really find beauty in the madness of our cities, but they worked. You know, we 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 didn't have we didn't need to be square grid system cities. The organic nature of our growth, it reflected the richness of our faith. And there's a really interesting talk by um, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad on this topic. I'll send you guys a link after about just this topic, about why the madness of Cairo made absolute sense to the people of Cairo, but to a European, it just really, really was a, um, a way of assessing and, and judging um, these, uh, these poor natives. Okay, any other question on that before we move on? I've got one. So um, just off the back of what you were saying, um, I just want to know like, what you think about the whole like internalization of um, that like imperial, um, sorry, um, that we've kind of just kind of seen seeing ourselves through the same lenses of Orientalism that were created and kind of like books were written about and stuff and how that can be separated now and like how to reclaim like you know our identities and our cultures and our histories and like just what you think and say about that. I think it's a really important question I think it's probably the most critical question because it's it's fine to talk about this but if you can't act on this yeah. there's, no, there's no real value right. Um, the way the way I see this topic is um, can you guys all go on mute. Um, is 
if you firstly you have to understand when you read history books um you're reading a version of their history of you okay this is not this is not your history this is something i'm very passionate about a lot of people don't agree with me on this it doesn't matter if it's contemporary history or going back 50 years or even 30 years if you read a history of of the indian subcontinent or the middle east by a french guy I'm, uh, and I'm being very generalist here. There's obviously exceptions. When I grew up studying history in school and, and university, you know, I assumed this was my history because these are these are big name professors. They have PhDs and they have. And if you go to the sources, they have all the sources, and it looks good. It looks like they've done their work. So how do you how do you, how do you critique that? You know, if you talk about a, a battle in India or a battle in Turkey, and 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 a white guy's written a whole volume on it, how do you criticize that, right? You have to say, well, it must be my history because it looks it looks good. And he has a degree from Cambridge. Um, but this is interesting. You really have to dissect how this works because once you go into the sources of these books, you realize most of a most of these people who were Orientalist couldn't speak Arabic, couldn't speak Farsi, they couldn't speak any of the dialects, even within 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 these lands. So what they would do was they would use earlier versions. Of other academics work and they would expand on it and they would use a lot of creative you know freedoms to define historic events if for example if you want to read about if you want to read about the, the sunni shia split that's a very popular topic amongst orientalists let's tell the world why the muslims can't start fighting because they have this tribal you go into the study of it and you realize very quickly almost almost none of them speak arabic they don't really understand the historic significance of this hadith and how these things are so it's, it's just really baffling that even till today in universities in the West, we're reading books about Islamic history and Asian history and African history by, and when I say white, I don't mean as a, as a, as a, as a negative thing, but essentially it's to define the way of thinking. It's, it's by people who don't really understand our world. So first step is when you study these books today, please, please understand this is someone's interpretation of your history and your past. This is not who you are. This is not your identity. This is how someone thinks you look. So don't accept that as, well, if this book tell if this book tell us that the British did a good thing in India by colonizing them, and they have examples of um, the legal system and they have examples of the railway, which is a very popular argument, um, then it must be right. We deserve to be subjugated because look, there's examples of the GDP was low when the British came, the GDP went up. Therefore, this is a good thing. That's the first step. Two, if you can find literature which is written by, and I'm going to be very, don't judge me, but our people, because I don't think you can say our people very easily without defining what that is. But if you're, if you're speaking in the dichotomy of the West, let's just start doing this because who are our people? Well, I would say it doesn't matter if it's, you know, if, if it's a, you know, if it's an academic based in the West or the East, you do get Orientalists who are, who are our people, by the way, too. You do get some really good journalism by people who still think the same way as, as, the, as the colonial masters did. So to find books that I think are about people who understand Arabic, who can who can talk about their land? Who can go through manuscripts in museums and they can really understand the the nuances between events and identities and and how and how we were in the past? So I think too, that's a good that's a good exercise to do. And I've I've tried to do that on my website. I have a list of books which I've tried to try to keep very. Um, they're mostly in English by and and they're by our authors. Um, three, I think I think you have to three start being. Um, very interested in history. I think you really have to understand what's happened in the past before you can understand who you are. Um, it's a very, it's a very cliche way of saying it, right? But I think it's important to understand. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a past that we have to redefine for ourselves. So when I grew up, I read about the history of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, through the eyes of Western academics, and and I was so ashamed because I was reading my faith through Western authors who were not even of my faith. So, so, and, and, you know, when you read books on Salahuddin or you read books on any of the, the famous, you know, generals, or, you know, it could be anything, right? If you're reading them by Western academics, you will understand the history through their eyes. Um, so, so understand history. And I, and I think finally, I think just, just be proud of who you are because it's very difficult to be proud of who you are in the West without being an apologist. Um, so when you go to a museum, this is, this is one of my favorite examples. If you're in Paris or London or Toronto and you go to uh, the main museums, right? You go to the Islamic exhibition. I think it's become almost like a token. Can you, can you really be a, a Western capital without having an exhibition on Islamic art? And, you know, it's almost like, no, you can't. How can you have a museum 
without having some antiques from each era of human history. So in London, they have everything from the Greeks to um, the Romans, to the Indians, to the, to the Mughals. So when you go to see these exhibitions, this is, this is a way of breaking away from these chains of thinking of yourself through their eyes. Please remember, you're not, you're not looking at your history um, from a perspective of they finally understood our history. This is why they have these museums with, the, with art pieces and vases and tile works, to, this beautiful thing. Sorry, Omar, you're on mute. Did oh, you want sorry. to say something? Oh, nothing. I was saying that you're right. Like, it's more so like, it's not that you, we finally understand your history. It's more so that we own your history and here's how. Um, just a quick addition, um, what you were saying before about our history not being something that should be, um, why it's not studied from our point of view. I just want to add that like, in the colonial project and going back to Alex's question about, you know, what's the difference between imperialism, colonialism and um, Orientalism, they're part of the same state apparatus, right? Like they're all progressions of the mercantilist extraction tradition of colonialism. And those are a lot of words, so I'll dissect them real quick. You can't have colonialism before Orientalism and you can not have Orientalism before, sorry, you can't have imperialism before colonialism and colonialism comes right after uh, Orientalism. So Orientalism, colonialism, imperialism, which lead to extraction. So your, um, the reason why Napoleon and the British administration sent boatloads, and I'm like not exaggerating, like there is, exa like there is listed evidence of ship names that were sent with scholars. The reason why Napoleon and British and all of these other colonial powers sent scholars was to, like Ali said, to understand the history to better, better um, control it. But also, it was a, it was a, it was a cry of um, pity because it's like, oh look, you were once great, you know, the Mughals were once great, but you're not anymore. The Egyptians built the pyramids, but look what you've become now. Let us help you. Let us define you. And what followed after is the, is the Orientalist, that's the Orientalist project and the colonialism, uh, administ the colonial administration was able to do that because they established power structures. Going back to Ali's point about, uh, you know, institutions still dictating our history, it goes even one step deeper. There are schools in India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka today that are using textbooks for Hindi, Urdu, Tamil, uh, that were created by British scholars. So, you know, talk about continuing mm -hmm. legacies. We're learning our own languages from the perspectives of British administrations, which were internalized by institutions like Sir Sayed College in, in, um, in India or Aligarh University in India. Sorry, Sir Sayed College in uh, Pakistan and uh, Aligarh University in, uh, in India. These are colonial traditions and institutions that are still upholding the legacies, right? So, going back, uh, so hopefully that answers Alex's question because, yeah, like they're all part of the same colonial, uh, the same extraction project, but it's like they're layers of one another. They're the evolutionaries. Yeah, there's a really interesting commentary on this topic because um, there's a I can't remember who said it, but there's a story where. There was a French, there's a French officer in, in some unnameless African country because they don't have names, it's just Africa. And he was speaking to this, to this um, native and, and the native responded in, um, in English and the French, and the French, you know, the Frenchman was civilized. And he said, but you, how do you know English? You've never been to England. And he said, well, I've never been to France, but I speak French too. And, and this is because this was under the French colony. And, and this is, the reason this is an important story is because what, what the French did was, what the British did was when they would go to these countries, they would not teach them French. They would not teach them English. They would teach them a very small fraction of the world of their own language. This is a really important psychological development, by the way. If you teach a person half of a language and, and you think, well, how can you do that? Well, you really, really limit your engagement. You, you don't educate them to the full extent that you do your own people. You limit how, how far they can think and articulate themselves. So what happens is over time, you lose your own mother tongue and then you speak Creole, any of the Creole languages, French, 
and then you try and write poetry, right? Try and try and write poetry when you speak, when you speak really kind of like a bastard language with almost no richness in how you've been taught. You can't create a culture on the back of this. And the language is, is the way to develop culture and civilization is, is critical. And, and the French and the British understood this. This is why they were teaching us, A, our own languages back to us in a crippled way. And B, when we did learn French or English, you know, we couldn't create, you couldn't get a Shakespeare in, in, in subcontinent who's learned English from the British, it's impossible. Uh, and that's something to remember with languages. So a lot of us, a lot of us are either uh, migrants who've come to the West and we speak their languages, but this is different to how it happened when they were in our lands. We were not learning, um, you know, we were not reading Milton and, um, and John Locke or any of these, these big names, and we couldn't think to the same heights. And then what this did was this reaffirmed the idea that, look, these people are so stupid. We told them our languages, they still can't put a letter together, which makes sense because they, you know, they, they're not capable of thinking the way and their brains are smaller. So it reinforced this idea of um, them being um, not very civilized. Okay, any other questions? I actually have a question. So um, actually what you said about the museums triggered this question. So uh, a lot of our history is actually in museums in foreign countries. And I was wondering to what extent do you think that um, maybe I don't know if to say governments in our home countries are responsible for this, but like knowing that they are not really showing who we are, our history, but rather um, rephrasing it or showing it from their own perspective. Like why would like other governments knowing this work along with it or just give up like a lot of our historical artifacts and, and things just to these countries? Like, do you think they're responsible also? I think I think there's a definitely so it's, it's, it's very easy to be it's very easy to blame right and say the West is you know they're the bad guys and 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 so this isn't this isn't an anti-Western talk by the way um, before I did this my mom said to me are you sure you won't have this conversation because they could be watching you and I was like this is not this is not an anti-Western talk the whole point of this is to understand and deconstruct this because okay so recently the British Museum had this exhibition on um, if you guys remember this it was called the contribution of Islam to Western art, right? Or something like this. Something absolutely like, it sounded beautiful. And I thought, finally, finally, we're gonna have, we're gonna have the most prestigious, you can argue, the most museum in the world. The British Museum is probably, is better than the Louvre. I've been to the Louvre, it's not that great. So they're gonna have this entire exhibition on Islamic art and how it contributed, right? This sounds really promising. Um, so if you guys saw my story, I did this in November or December. It's in my highlights. It was, it was done in, so A, this is how they did this, by the way. This is, this is a perfect example of how Muslims, how, how, how natives, and this doesn't have to be Muslim, it could be anybody, works with these institutions to reinforce the same problems. So the person, what they did was, the British Museum worked with a, a curator who was Arab, who was Muslim, who was a woman. Now, if her face is in the front, no one is gonna criticize this event and say, why is a why is a you know a European doing this? So so that was first. So I thought this could be good. Inshallah, it will be good, it will be a good event. So I went to it, and and I realized it was done in it was done in um, I think cooperation with the Islamic Museum in Malay in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, which is one of the biggest museums of Islamic art in the East. So so somehow the British Museum spoke to the Malaysian uh, Ministry and they agreed we would loan all these things from your museum and take them to the West. So, some, so they have checks and balances, I assume, in Malaysia. Someone asked them at one point, what are you doing? And they said, well, this is our agenda. This is what we're going to show. This is what it will look like. And I would assume some academic, somebody with knowledge would say, hold on a second. This isn't really a contribution to Islam. This is something else. And this is what it was. When you went to the exhibition, essentially, it was an exhibition on Orientalism. There's nothing more to say. Essentially, that's what it was. They had, and, and you know what the contribution of the Malaysian Museum was? They had given them random objects of Islamic significance, like a like a helmet from a from a from a battle in in Istanbul the, from the Napoleon time, or there was a random dagger or a vase, and they so they lumped these random things in the middle, and then they had this French Orientalist art all around the museum, and this is the ex so this is why this is an important topic. How can you say this is the Islamic contribution to the West? What they're saying is. 
let's let's just deconstruct this. What they're saying is, your contribution to our art was you influenced our artists to go to your land and paint you and bring it back. That show that show influence on us. This is a really offensive. If you think about this, this is really offensive. They're saying your influence was so important that we had to come study you. Now, to to most people, they walked into exhibition and they said, "Well, this is beautiful. I like I like these colors. I like this." these big strong you know soldiers wearing like armor and praying in really weird ways um and people were happy with the exhibition but the problem was the problem was um islam has a very very deep integration with europe in almost every single way especially art right and and they didn't show any of it they didn't show any of it they, they could have picked one artist like william morris so william morris is from where i live down the road right if you guys know William Morris, he was an Orientalist. He was a rich British man and he went to Syria and Palestine and, um, and the region in Egypt and, and Iran especially. And he loved the art and he said, this is, this is beautiful. This is, and you know, this is my, this is my muse. I love this. He bought it back. He, he reimagined some of the designs, but most of his stuff essentially is Turkish floor patterns. And he used it. His name was not mentioned once in the entire exhibition. William Morris now is probably the most famous um, art, um, artist from the arts and craft movement of the Victorian era. He's the most important artist. His name wasn't in there. There was no contribution. So how did the Malaysian Museum ever agree to this? I don't understand. No one ever deconstructed the proposal and said, actually, what you're doing is you're just showing European art, which represents us. This doesn't, this doesn't show our contribution to you. This shows our presence in your art. This is, it's a completely different thing. And I just, I can't understand how, them, how people do that. And I think a lot of it is either politics, you get money, you get, you know, the home office in the UK was probably like, if you do this for us, we'll do something for you, you scratch our back. So a lot of times it's political movements or reasons that these things happen. How many people like me do you think exist in the government? Not many, right? Most people are gonna be like, no, we'll just do this. It's fine. Um, our name will be in London. Can you imagine the, the you know, Islamic Museum of Malaysia and London is just going to be so prestigious? I mean, I lost respect for those guys. I don't understand how, how you would do that. So, so that's, that's this, maybe that's how people do it. They don't understand what's going on. They don't think critically. And, and they still think we are what they tell us um, we are. Thank you. Thank you. So it was all very white. So I've got uh, a couple of questions. Um, I would love for these conversations to continue because I think I have so many questions and so many thoughts and um, I'm gonna try to keep it concise. So I happened to attend that uh, exhibit as well. Um, I, I enjoyed seeing a lot of those items, but like you, I didn't appreciate really the way it was portrayed and you know, some of the some of the plaques and inscriptions. Um, I happened to go to, I think a museum in Manchester during that trip and I noticed they had uh, they had a portrait of an African American, of an African person uh, somewhere, and um, they had a plaque next to it that said, "We're not sure how to place this, or where to place this, or how really to talk about this, um, but we're looking for suggestions on how to improve how we talk about, you know, slaves that were brought over from Africa." Um, and so I'm, I'm very curious to see how we can maybe move those conversations along within the context of Islamic art and culture. Um, because, so I live in Chicago at the moment and we've got uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, which is supposed to be one of the best art museums in the world. And if you go to the Islamic art section, um, first of all, it's incredibly small. It's like this little yeah. hallway, a few tapestries. They've got uh, like a hookah, hookah bowl. They've got a bunch of, uh, jewelry from Bukhara, which isn't probably the nicest thing there. Um, but if you read, even there's like this giant monolithic um, description of Islam, and it, it literally makes it sound like Islam was a ripoff of Christianity, um, rather than like a subsequent, I guess, step. Um, and and the, the, the perspective is really kind of messed up. And so within the context of museums, I think, you know, I'd love to kind of hear other people's thoughts. Um, another question I have, uh, we were, Zara, you mentioned the Sunni versus Shia um, conflict and how that's been ex like, you know, talked about and written from the perspective of Westerners. Um, I think something that I struggle with is kind of communicating the, I guess, the, the value um, of 
discussing Orientalism uh, and kind of advancing that because, so for example, if I was to tell some of my friends like, you know, this is Orientalism, it exists, and they've kind of exacerbated tensions between Sunnis and Shias, they'd be like, well, can't Sunnis and Shias think for themselves? You know, aren't we all, you know, mature adults who can, you know, think critically and analyze things? Um, and so I think some of that relates to the internalization that we've all kind of... Yeah, those are excellent points. So I'll, I'll sit up there and let people talk, but we'd love no, to hear that. Do you, do you guys have any other experiences like those, Iman? So, yeah, um, speaking from a person who actually practices uh, sonic geometry, um, it's been like such a long journey for me, but perhaps one of the earliest books that I could find on Islamic geometry were actually written by uh, Westerners. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard the name of Eric Grug. He's the first book that I bought. Um, and even so, now a lot of um, Middle Eastern artists or Middle Eastern geometrists are um, pinpointing that there's a lot of inconsistencies in his designs and yet he's trying to defend them and yet somehow he thinks he's right. Um, and then another thing that I've always kind of, I hate the word arabesque because it's such a colonizer's word. Um, the word arabesque means that it's art that's Arab-like, but whenever I am, you know, looking at Islamic art and whatnot, it's always, that's the descriptive word of Islamic art when it generally, essentially, Islamic art should be viewed as Islamic art and not Arab-like. And I think, um, there's just such a lot of gray matter there. And I always feel like, okay, I always want to say something, you know, about that because there's a lot of things like you mentioned William Morris. The only reason why I discovered Islamic geometry was because of William Morris, because I had to dig deeper because I was so infatuated with his works of art and his patterns and his tapestries. And the more I dug deeper, the more I realized, okay, this guy literally totally ripped off um, Islamic geometry, and then also M.C. Escher uh, was highly, incredibly influenced by uh, Islamic art. I actually have his book on how M.C. Escher was influenced by Islamic art, and essentially all of his art and all of his uh, tessellation of like organic shapes derived from that. And so um, there's just such a there's there's such a big influence. Um, of Islamic art on Western artists and Western artists kind of just, you know, make a very bleak mention, which disheartens me because I think that they basically owe their careers to such a great uh, artistic movement that happened in, in Islam. Yeah. Just to add I something to say. Okay, so one of the first things that I want to say is this term Islamic art. This is just coming on uh, what Iman just said. One of the questions I have is why do you think everything from Spain all the way to Uzbekistan is linked under one category? This is a question you have to ask yourself. You know, in, in European countries, for every decade, there's a different, uh, there's a different categorization. This is my, my so, first question to you. Why do you think that's can happening? I, so can I, I answer know the your first answer, question? but like I'm asking oh, you. Oh, so the first, so to answer your first question is, okay, there are, I mean, in Islamic art, within Islam, I'm just giving a general view. In Islamic art, there are many movements um, within each component. So, you know, the, there's Moroccan art, there's Iranian art, there's uh, Syrian art, there's Cairo, there's art in Cairo. I'm, I'm aware, All of them, I'm, I'm talking from... Uh, so basically, I know, I know what you're alluding to. So like in Europe, there's the Renaissance, the Baroque era, the Impressionism, the Post-Impressionism and whatnot. There are movements such as these and within Islamic art, such as the Umayyad era, the Abbasid era, the Fatimid uh, era. In Morocco, a lot of what you see, the art that you see is actually influenced by the Fatimid era. So to go back to what you're saying in, in the Ali ibn Abi, uh, Imam Ali ibn uh, Abi Talib created Kufic script. So there is early, very early works of Islamic art from the beginning of Islam. And then it constantly transitioned and constantly uh, evolved uh, within each and every era. Um, the, the Muslims in Spain um, brought their art from Morocco and this was during the Abbasid era 
or do yeah during the Abbasid era. So um, there's I guess her a point lot. was her point was why do we lump it as one if there is such diversity, right? Why do yeah, we use I don't need one an explanation. term? Or... Yeah, no, I'm yeah. So why do we because called you know Orientalism? I think that's why. I think that's why. I mean. I always, when people don't understand what Islamic art is, I do dig deeper and try to explain to them, you know, that there's three major components, but within each component is extremely diverse. But unfortunately, yes, Orientalism has contributed to the fact that Islamic art is generally just very bleak, um, very simple in design and whatnot, when in reality, it's not. I think also one of the things is by lumping it all as one group, what you're saying is your contribution is, is actually a lot more minimal. It's not as rich, it doesn't have that complexity, it doesn't have that growth yes. and all of the other aspects yeah. you yeah. assign to yourself, but you minimize in the other by, by kind of putting this one block, everything gets Exactly. And yeah, is, I mean, exactly. Essentially, it's using the same, it's like describing Islamic art or any form of art as just like arabesque art, when in reality it isn't. And one of the, sorry, Lorelai, I'm interrupting you, but just, just no, going to no, follow on from one of your first things that you actually mentioned, Eric Brieg, and, and I think just my experience of um, understanding Orientalism in a way um, is in the art world, just that separation. One of the things that he likes to do is he likes to approach these patterns from a very sort of mechanical perspective um, and totally removes any um soul if you like any of the faith any of the spiritual tradition behind it any of the the influence of that or or the fact that geometry could be this pathway to explore those ideas it's completely removed from this. you know very much going back to your recent stories about um translations of Rumi removing his spiritual connection his his the essence of his work um and I find that um that that's how a lot of art is represented but one of the questions i suppose i have have i mean we have a particular experience of of this from being part of the diaspora in the west what i find interesting is i would have expected people in the orient uh to be slightly more aware of their history but i think they 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 don't really i wonder how aware they are of the Orientalist narrative within their own space, given that they have a better awareness of their history than, say, I did. Does that make sense? Am I making sense of that? It does, concern? but but their natives would expect for them to know things. Like, come on. Um, no, I think I think I think it's a really I think it's a false assumption that because you live in the East, you'll be more aware of it. Um, and and I think if you start with that as a truism, I think you'll struggle because because in many ways we've we've come. And I'm assuming a lot of us are from the East, but forgive me if you're from the West, it's fine. If you, if you, if you grew up in this culture, I think you're able to self-reflect and be self-aware. And I think that self-awareness is a big issue in any culture, in any country, in any race, in every religion. The self-awareness doesn't happen unless, unless you're shown this. Orientalism is not a topic in the East. It really isn't. And I've been approached by a lot of students of art and photography in the East saying, can you talk about this with some friends and, and we're doing a book club or something? Can you talk about this? And they're fascinated because they've never thought about this. They've said, how could we be so blind to our own um, treatment in, in literature that we are studying ourselves? So I think self-awareness is the problem. Um, but just to end the composition on the art, removing the essence and lumping it as one category is the heart of Orientalism. If you can, if you can describe an entire people from, from Morocco all the way to Indonesia in one word, like, You've just, you've just removed the entire richness and depth. I mean, can you imagine defining Europe just as an English speaking area? There's French, there's German, the, the contribution of the Russians, right? You, you can't imagine doing this, but today you're just, you know, people ask me all the time, do you, do you speak Arabic because you're Muslim? I'm like, well, yeah, I guess, like we all speak Arabic. But this is, this is the problem with art as well, because um, you, you can lump it as one and it's fine. Okay, let's move on to something else. Do you guys have any other questions on this before yeah. we move oh, on? So I, I have a question. Sorry. I'll go. Anyone else? Okay. After you, Iman. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I had two questions actually. The first one is um, where do you draw the line between uh, self orientalism or self orientalization and um, like highlighting existing differences between the so called East and West? Um, and where does this like self-orientalization become dangerous? Like, where do you 
where do you have the questions? How do you detect really them? Really, heavy questions. Um, <laughs> self I had another one actually as well, but self orientism is is a big is a big thing. So a lot of times people would say, "Well, you're criticizing um, Steve McCurry or any of these." Just just go to literature, for example. You're criticizing Kipling or Conrad, and these are the famous Orientalists in literature. Um, but what about, what about your own authors? You guys are doing the exact same thing. You're describing yourself in the exact same stereotypes and racial slurs. You're doing the exact same thing as we're doing. And this happens in child photography very, very often. If you follow a lot of Instagram accounts from people in um, the South Asian region, especially, I don't know why these guys are more prone to this. You find that what they've done is they've studied the National Geographic model of photography for so long that they go to they go to shanty towns in in Africa or in Asia and their own their, their own towns by the way they're not traveling far they do the exact same portraits the exact same framing the exact same there has to be an intensity in the eyes of an old man with creases he needs to be looking really really like either he's high or really angry and do you and these are our people right how are we doing the same thing so self orientalism definitely exists I think I think it's more a mode of thinking rather than a color or an identity really um, and most of us who've been raised in the West, we're all tainted in a way because we think the same way. And we typically have the same, if you go to the East, you'll have the same stereotypes, you know. I'm gonna get food poisoned because the food is dirty, the water's gonna be dirty, it's gonna be hot, there's gonna be mosquitoes, Cairo is smelly and dirty, Karachi is this. These are these are small examples, but you judge you judge your own people because you've you started thinking the same way. I'm guilty of the same thing, we will do it. Um, the difference is when you can't be self-aware of it and a lot of people say well what's wrong with me taking a photo of a, of a, of a naked baby by the river it's a, you know I'm not you know it's a reality it is a reality um, but the problem is a wider body of work and we come into that um, what else do you ask Iman that's one question yeah um, it's relating to that and it's um, basically we have obviously a lot of societal issues in the east and um, <coughs> issues that like didn't exist prior to colonialism and um, at the time of the Prophet like they were practically non-existent. So how do you go on about them and how much blame can you put on the West and its colonialism? Like I know when I speak to, for example, Westerners, I, I tend to blame colonizers more because they need to be aware and, and stop like um, viewing us from this orientalist lens of course and then when i speak to so-called easterners i try to um like blame us more so that in in the yeah in hopes of like addressing the issues and and trying to like combat them but when i speak to like a mixed audience how much can i blame uh colonialism on the issues for example i don't know domestic violence which actually exists in in europe as well or racism or mistreatment of like uh, domestic workers and and yeah racism especially so I don't know it's a it's a really hard question I don't think I have the answer but one one thing <laughs> I do want to say on that is what what is interesting about the this is not an anti-western session but let me just end this with this is an interesting experiment right this has this this never happened in reverse and although there's a lot of crit critiques of Edward Said and this whole idea of orientalism the challenge that I always pose is did this ever happen in return? Because the Muslims did travel to the West. We have examples, we have literature, we have travel logs. We we knew who the Venetians were, we knew who the you know, we, we knew the Europeans for a long time. We've been on the border with them for a very long time. We've never done this. We've never gone to we didn't go to Constantinople and come back and say, Oh, by the way, did you know those monks? You know, they drink blood and they and they worship the sun. No, we don't have this. We, you know, you can probably find a weird example, but on the whole, when the East explored the West, we didn't come back, we didn't create a false narrative, we didn't say these people um, are really just, you know, they're, they're everything that we're not, they don't, you know, we, we didn't have this experience. So I think for wow. us, when it happened to us, I think we would sound prepared because we would assume, why would you fabricate? Why would you, why would you do this? And I think it's taken a long time for people to even come to the reality that, um, it's not that easy to understand and then the whole the whole empire era it was a very interesting one um but i don't think i have the answer Iman. i think if someone else wants to talk about that i'm happy but it's something yeah to thank you yeah. i think when we talk about how critiques of orientalism the concept by edward Said from within the orient there's a, a big difference between 
um, like post-colonial uh, countries that uh, got independence through revolutionary practices like Algeria versus ones that were just transfers of power like India and Pakistan. So I know Indian academics hate Orientalism. They really don't like the concept. And part of it is just when the same education system, the same laws and the same theory is still within those uh, transfer of power post-colonial republics, it's kind of self-fulfilling in a sense that that same academia has just been um, gone throughout. Like I've looked at some of the um, some of the high school text, uh, high school texts for Pakistani in, in Pakistan public schools and high schools, and it's like praising the Morley Minto reforms, which I thought was crazy. Um, so, and, and that's kind of a big difference if you look at how the Al Algerians might view the French versus how Indians and Pakistanis would talk about English, even though they were both brutal colonization, but the way in which the government's achieved power is different. Um, and then something someone asked earlier about uh, different uh, returning art back. Uh, I, I think of like like the Kohinoor diamond, for example. A lot of these governments, the the diamond that British now have uh, in in London, it was taken from India, and now both Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Indian governments all have a claim to it. And it's a big mess because these governments struggle with their own forms of legitimacy and how. You know, do they really represent the people? Are they just, you know, these post-colonial hangovers really muddy both educational curricula, how people self-identify, and how self-fulfilling, in a sense, Orientalism might be within the Orient itself? So I think, uh, can I just interject for a second? Um, I don't think that Orientalism is meant to be a catch-all term for all the societal problems that exist mm -hmm. in, in the lands that were previously colonized. Like, there is, as uh, we're probably all aware, either by living there or traveling there, there is a lack of, um, there are gaps that need to be filled. Like there are, um, it's very much a state in progress, right? I think what, what, uh, what Hamza, what you were talking about with Indian uh, academics being very uh, opposed to Orientalism and using that as an explanation to uh to cast doubt into the power structures that are right like it's the reason why it's because it's like they're defined by that you know we still have the parliamentary system in in pakistan india mm -hmm. as far as i'm aware sri lanka as well so you know it becomes really challenging to say okay look what the british said uh look what the british did but also we're still benefiting from that system you know like the indian government for example will constantly say that oh actually like india only uh, sorry uh, British added X number of uh, miles in uh, the railway. The railway, the rest of it was all us. So look at our postal system. It exactly, works. look at our postal <laughs> system, and like you know, these these kinds of things are becoming really hard to say that okay, this was what was as part of the colonial structure, and this is what is. So, mm -hmm. um, just a quick response. Um, there, okay, so like in terms of disciplines of studies, which are often muddled in like the acad academic world, there is Occidentalism. Occidentalism is the complete opposite of Orientalism, that you as an Easterner define yourself by kind of taking shots at the West, you know. Uh, and the books on Occidentalism was, were published around the same time as Orientalism uh, in, the eight, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but now what's really interesting is that like this idea of the subaltern uh, where you have, you know, like notable historians and academics like Gatri Spivak and like all these other um, academics who've really said that, you know, there is a voice of the person who was formerly colonized to, 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 to say that this is my history, to this is my experience and show the mirror to society and say, okay, look, these are the problems that still exist, but this is how awesome we are, right? Like, there's a, I think there is a movement, whether it's through art or academia or filmmaking or uh, just, you know, existing where like people are doing kick-ass things because they are able to convey a story and experience uh, from an entirely domestic lens, from an entirely localized and uh, personal lens, which I think is a good response for like, how do we start challenging? I think Summer is what you were questioning. Yeah, someone about. asked, how can you how can you correct it? And that's something if you yeah. guys follow Sacred Footsteps, we've we've tried to tackle. Well, first thing was we, we started talking about it. We raised awareness to it, we explained it. We've done at least three podcasts on it. I've written two articles on it. We started this, this trend called um, 
come in called um Omar, what's it called? The uh, um, um, right to narrative. What's the what's the campaign called? You're mute. You're mute. Yeah, it's called reclaim. Reclaim the narrative. So we've started highlighting photographers specifically that we think are defining themselves through their own lens. And uh, if you guys follow the lives we had yesterday and the day before on Sacred Footsteps. We've been bringing to the front photographers from different parts of the world who, who are talking about themselves through a different lens. So you can correct it, I think, by giving voice to those people and, and a platform because typically you don't find them on National Geographic. You don't find them on the big sites, right? So we're not a huge platform as like a footsteps, but we're using the position we have to, to do as much as we can, but more needs to be done. Okay, I think, I think let's move on. So by the way, we passed the hour point, but if you guys have to drop off, you can, we'll end this maybe in my 15 minutes, if you guys want to continue. I have nowhere to go. I don't know if you guys have somewhere to go. Um, the, the next thing that I really wanted to talk about was travel photography in, in as a, I guess, as a subset of, of Orientalism, because this is the one I think that impacts most of us today without thinking about, because we, we all use Instagram and we see photos um, all the time from different parts of the world. And there's many things I get angry about, and I think you guys probably feel the same way. And, and it's very difficult to interact with a photographer today and say, accuse them of being an Orientalist because it's a, it's a, it's a very heavy loaded accusation. How can you just call someone an Orientalist? Most people are like, what are you talking about? I, I just went to Kenya. I'm not an Orientalist. I'm just, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just a photographer. I have no idea what you're talking about. So it's very hard to, to accuse, and I don't think we should accuse people. I think I've tried to, and I'm guilty of this, sometimes you just can't help it and you see something so offensive and you wanna comment and say, this is ridiculous. Did you get permission from these people when you photograph these people? Um, you know, do the parents know? Like, you know, there's a lot of incidents where ethical questions come up in photography. So in the, in the space of travel photography, um, if you guys remember, there's a, about a year ago now, I started this campaign against National Geographic because what they did was they awarded this one photo um, I think it won second prize as travel photo of the year. And, and the photo was in India. It was, it was of two families sleeping on rooftops. And there were some children who were not wearing any clothes. There were some women who were exposed. And, and there was an Australian photographer who had photographed them without them knowing. And she, she won second prize in National Geographic's travel photo, photo of the year. And, and I thought this was outrageous. This goes against every single, so they had at least three, it broke three rules on their own website, by the way. I read through the entire guidelines on National Geographic. It broke three rules. And I highlighted them and I said, you know, without even calling you names or anything, and I can, you've broken your own rules. Can you explain how you can justify breaking your own rules? Not even any imaginary, imaginary ethical rules that I have, but you've broken your, and they couldn't. They, they straight out, refused to answer every one of my points because they couldn't defend them. Um, so so this, this brings a question up, is, is, this, is this a growing problem? Because I think it's a growing problem that we as, as observers need to be aware of when we view our own land, our, our, our people, our land, or other land, other people. Do we know what we're looking at is actually an accurate representation? And, and this is an important point because if you're from, if you're from any country that's being photographed, you can immediately notice and say, no, 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 this is not my country. I know my people, this is not who we are. However, think about this. If you view of a photo taken in Chile or, or Mexico, do you know enough about our culture? Could you, could, you, could you separate the truth from the fiction? Most times you probably couldn't. You would assume, well, this is what a tribe looks like. This is what they live like. If you've never been to a country you never heard of, you will imagine this is who they are. And, and I think this has caused a global um, travel, um, trend where people go to certain countries to look for certain images because they've seen them popularized and they want to capture the exact same image and you know if you go to india you want to you know you want to see those same people doing those same things in temples if you go to iran you want to get you want to have a picture of a woman in chador walking by a wall that says i hate america you know so you have these expectations that you need to see these images and people who don't know those cultures end up accepting this as not a full truth, maybe a partial truth. And, and this is where the problem lies. Um, and, and this is something that I, you know, we can talk about briefly if you guys want. Um, 
and and I fully fully blame people like Steve McCurry on this because he's the early father of modern travel photography, and the reason the blame goes on him is I think he's inspired a generation of photographers who are copycats who want to do what he's done, and what a lot of people don't know is he you know he used to classify himself as a travel um, I think of a journalist or a, or a photojournalist, meaning he used to work for newspapers, right? And then when he was caught fabricating his photos and staging photos and photoshopping his photos, he said, no, 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 I'm a storyteller. And this was his way of getting out of criticism. And but what he's done is now if you go to your explore tab on Instagram, for some reason, Instagram thinks I like to see pictures of tribes in Africa because I'm always viewing them. Click on who's taking the photos. Almost every single time, the photographer is a white photographer. And it's, it's, just, it's just template. You have pictures of children with, with like a bone through the nose, with a tattoo. And you can find copycats all over Instagram. And they'll have like tens of thousands of followers. And then they'll have a book launch. They'll have a, you know, and they've been awarded awards. And, and I just worry about this because, because these people, these voices are being taken away. These are, this is not the richness of these lands. So this is something that I constantly talk about. Um, so I'll open up to you guys now. Do you think this is a growing problem with, with the rise of social media and travel? Um, or do you think this is something that people are becoming more aware of? Um, and we should just back off and say people will learn on their own. I think it's definitely a problem. I, um... I'm, I, I photograph because I've gone to travel a lot. And so I, I generally, the way that I try to not repeat, you know, sort of the Steve McCurry aesthetic um, is to just shoot wide, you know? So a lot of, I do a lot more like architectural photography and urban photography because I find that to be a little less orientalizing than, um, you know, trying to get the Iranian woman in her chador, for instance, with, you know, the, you know, death to America. Um, you know, sign behind her. Um, but yeah, I think social media makes it a lot worse because we're looking for that cute, like Instagram aesthetic, right? Like the, you know, the picture of like the girl, you know, from the back holding your hand as you're walking to, you know, whatever, like monument. And so that's, I mean, that's, it's not really a related example, but that's sort of, we like these templates that, as you said, we all just like to go to these places, find that photograph, take it and, you know, sort of like check it off. Be like, yeah, I did that. Um, and I think it really just reduces, you know, any sort of conversation about what we're doing or what we're even photographing to, you know, a double tap on your phone screen. I think there's also this like rise of a weird um, counter, like a response to that whole thing by diaspora, people from the Orient or whatever, where they're like, oh, like I've seen these, these narratives. These aren't our narratives. I don't like the, the whatever country I'm from, I know isn't like this. And they'll go back to their really westernized elite neighborhoods and take pictures of you know, basically just westernized high fashion and high culture that exists in there, wherever they're from, and they'll promote that instead. And it's this weird thing, like, no, you're either, you're either copying the West and taking on their upper class elite, you know, like fancy chandeliers that look like they were imported from France or something, I don't know, um, versus poor ethnic native stuff. And we lose the middle part that's our own ethnic or our own like native high culture and stuff like that kind of gets lost in between those two things that look good on social media. But even I think, even if it's not high culture from your own country, even if it's actually the culture of a poorer community, um, I think right, the right. self-hate element that develops is, is really interesting. I mean, I grew up using the P word because I wanted to separate myself because you know it was it was commonly used uh, as a slur um and i wanted to separate myself from other ones who you know who were slightly more backward Wait. you know and to be what's kind of the... nazira what's the p word sorry i don't know Paki. oh okay <laughs> see like in the bay area that's not even an issue like people yeah, call me like a Paki all slur. the time oh yeah so i, so I kind of i I listened to a really interesting lecture by, was it a lecture, it was a talk, I think it was Spike, I want to say Spike Lee, and he was criticizing Quentin Tarantino's use of the N-word, and ever since then, and applying it to the P-word, and this whole idea of ownership, I've been very careful of, of using it ever since, and understanding how I'm not really controlling the narrative by using that word, in fact, I'm just buying into this, um, you know, ideology that was already there, but 
I think also just going back to the, uh, I read something literally just two days ago. Um, there's a, a British uh, Bengali food blogger and she was talking about how um, everybody was sat on the floor eating when she went to visit Bangladesh. And a lot of people thought, oh, you know, she, she doesn't understand Bangladesh is so cosmopolitan. It's all this, that and the other. And I thought, actually, you know, you're taking this as a really negative thing. What's wrong with sitting on the floor? This is, this is our tradition. And this is actually it goes all the way back, not only just to the local tradition, but to our religious tradition as well. You know, why am I, why am I being forced to feel ashamed and, and like having to have a counter narrative to that? You know, sorry. Just to, yeah. Ethan, do you have yeah, that's something I find really interesting, actually, because a lot of the time when people represent a place in a certain way, for example, sitting on the floor and eating, or, I don't know, people living a certain way, I find it interesting that a lot of people will jump to aggressively be like, no, it's not like that at all. Look, we have like shiny malls and skyscrapers and these sorts of things. And so there's also an interesting loss of culture in the other direction because these are realities. And so there's... It's, feel so polarized sometimes trying to decide what is and is not accurate with these sorts of things. I'd be curious to see your thoughts on that, especially because a lot of the people discussing these concepts are usually higher educated, more privileged people that would only see this other side of the reality. I think that's why uh, I just want to add something. I think that's why we need to write more about us and more about our living. Maybe uh, sitting on the floor and eating means nothing for a Western, but it means gathering, it means uh, sharing in our culture. And so uh, I think the, one of the solutions that we can make is to write more. Write more about what we do, write more about how we eat and uh, how we taste food. And uh, every single bit of our life, we must uh, write about it more. That's why uh, we just, you know, stop people writing about us. If you want to read about us, just come to our writings and read what we know about your, about ourselves and what we can share with you. I so, agree. I have a, sorry, I have a question. I just want to, Ethan wanted to say something. I'll come back to you, Natasha. Ethan, did you want to say something? Oh, yeah. I just want to add, uh, part I wanted to add to the conversation is like a lot of this, uh, about the social media stuff about like you know how you see this picture of this amazing thing you know you want to go see it or whatever i think the, in, it's not it's really superficial people's like i think americans and like westerners have a very super superficial understanding of like the significance of that stuff and i think it i think that's a reason why the american tourists have a a stereotype of being like annoying and obnoxious yeah but okay. I would say even there are some people who are of a particular area who actually don't have much more than a soup, like, you know, myself until I started reading and understanding my own history and culture better. I would say that my understanding of, of you know, these things, even from Pakistan was very superficial. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's, there's, you have to understand that you are coming from a place of ignorance and that you want to abolish that and make a change to that. I think that's really important. I, I agree. Natasha, do you want to answer, ask your question? Sure. Um, I think, um, so being a diaspora kid myself, I think it is always a struggle to um, acknowledge that there is a variety of narratives. So, for example, in Pakistan, like a very wide share of the population does sit on the floor and eat on the floor but um there are like societies and there is like um and a class which doesn't right so there are different kind of realities and i think we should always um acknowledge our right in our diversity like we shouldn't fall into the same orientalist trap to say that there's only one narrative to our culture or that there is such a thing as a homogenous culture because that is not true either. <laughs> so there is like a, a society is very diverse in and of itself. So there is a reality for someone of being like an upper class Pakistani, being like super westernized, and that is their reality. And then there's the other reality as well <laughs> of someone who lives in a rural area. So I think like we should it's be all true, aware right? that we, 
yeah. um, trying to focus on only one narrative. Exactly, and I think that's the criticism we should always have, which is there's nothing wrong with showing one version. Um, if you can show the other versions as well, if you only focus on one, then you'll get that um, issue. First, uh, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add on what Natasha was saying as well, is that I think the problem when it comes to anybody, you know, like if it's a diaspora kid that goes back home or if it's a white photographer taking up a new project, I think what's really important that A, yes, it is accountability is incredibly important. So anyone that goes and claims to have a very um, narrow view and understanding um, or show, trying to show a very um, narrow perspective of this place, I think should be held accountable regardless. Um, and there isn't one reality. There's different experiences, different reality. I think when we claim that a certain reality is the only reality is when the problem happens. So even uh, Western photographers um, will go to different countries and, you know, consciously or unconsciously will take pictures of a certain type of person or certain type of reality and that's where it becomes problematic photographers who i mean i i think there are photographers who genuinely do try and they do their their best to kind of learn to the best of their ability and check their unbiases but that actually comes from a lot of labor from people of color who've held them accountable who told them that um, they need to, they need to, uh, you know, address or approach these kind of, um, approach these projects with a very critical lens, even with themselves. So um, I think like it, it's, th that, that's something I always struggle with too. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm Afghan, I'm Canadian. My experience is very different from, let's say, like an Afghan American because Afghan Canadians have only been around for about 30-ish years. So our experiences in Canada is very different than like someone who's like raised in America. So I don't know, like it's, I think accountability is incredibly important and, and, and staying away from any kind of like claiming anything that is a specific type of reality for, you know. Yeah, I think, you know, you know where I struggle with this because, so if you talk about accountability, right, it's really, it's really, we know, we know what we have to do. The issue is what do you, how do you do, how to deliver this change with the institutions already in place? And and who who's going to hold who to, who accountable? Who defines who defines what the you know what the rules are? And I think this is where you stumble. So at this level, you assume that there's self there's self discipline, there's self regulation happening, and this is what systems fail. So if National Geographic can't self regulate based on their own rules, how will we regulate photographers, for example? And and typically, what is what's happened is it's become very like a it's it's like a very you know each man for themselves on Instagram. You find something wrong. So many of you send me pictures saying, can you call out this person right now, like right now? And, you know, and sometimes I don't want to because I don't think this is the way to do it. I think sometimes if there's a really big problem, you know, I'll comment and someone else will comment. But we end up, we end up just naming and shaming. And I, I don't think that's working. I think, I think it's, you know, because then that person becomes defensive and they say, no, I'm not who you think. So anyway, I think if you have institutions like National Geographic, who hold these competitions and they hold this. If you speak to any photographer in Asia and Africa and you ask, who do you want to be one day? And I say, well, I want to publish for National Geo. The National Geo, that's the goal. If they're the goal, we're, we're never gonna improve because these guys keep saying year by year, we will improve, we will improve. We know there's problems in our editorial process. And they've, they've confessed this, but they never, they never change. They continue doing it. Okay, so we'll leave that point there. Um, did you guys, have any other questions? Yeah, one thing I was wondering is is whether photography is just as a as a discipline or as a practice, whatever, just inherently more vulnerable to something like Orientalism, because in a sense, it's a lot easier to 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 you know to show one picture and then have that story tell a story you know without any context. Whereas if you're writing something or if you're even making a video or uh, anything else, there's a lot more you can tell a lot more and you can give the context, whereas a photograph is just one instant, as opposed to something that tells a story on its, you know, over time or gives context. Um, so whether it's harder to regulate photography because of it just being a snapshot. Yeah, Sonia, did you have a question? Uh, hello, can Hi. you guys hear me? 
Yes, mm-hmm. we can hear you. All right. All right. So, uh, sorry, I joined late. So, uh, it uh, took me a time to get uh, to what you guys are talking about. So, I'm from Pakistan. I'm, I'm, I'm not a diaspora. So, I'm a native Pakistani. So, someone was talking about the people from, you know, India and Pakistan, how they take this Orientalism. Uh, I have a question first how to deal with the native Orientalist writers. For instance, I will just give you an example. When the American war on terrorism started here after the 9-11, you take out any opinion article from the you know, mainstream uh, Pakistani newspapers like Daily Times, etc., etc. Every single you know, the writer, they were justifying American war on terrorism. And literally, like one decade ago, even a person like me who's from academia, I felt prey to, to that conditioning because of course, we are exposed to that, you know, uh, material or the content which is being, you know, uh, uh, written in the daily, uh, you know, mainstream newspapers. So how to deal, because like someone said that in Pakistan, the problem is, which, you know, pissed me off a big time, that the narratives are deeply po- polarized between the liberal left and the extremist right, or maybe the right. So there's a lot of uh, you know, there are a lot of narratives which are happening and there's a lot of void, you know, because most of the authors in the, you know, well-known, uh, reputed, you know, magazines or you can say the newspaper articles, they studied from the West and, you know, somehow they are upholding or, you know, projecting the agenda yeah. or the narrative of the can US. I, can I answer that question? I think, yeah, yeah. I, think there's, I think you have to be really careful to draw a line between just being different in political variations, disagreeing with other people and saying this is a result of Orientalism. The war on terrorism, whatever you want to call it, and the war in Afghanistan, right? Some people were for it, some were against it. I don't take sides and say, well, this person is Orientalist because they, they, they think the war should be happening. To me, to me, that's just political differences. Um, but in terms of educating, in the, so on that point, I think, let's just speak, we, don't, we, we can't blame the West for everything, although we can try. Um, if you if you look at the education system, this is interesting because there's a reason there's a reason the West, especially the U.S., educate so many foreign um, VIPs. If you look at the leaders and presidents and princes of most countries, they study they study in the U.S. So what that, what what that means is you're in, you're already indebted to them by learning a certain way of um, you know thinking and the economic system. So when they go back home, they'll be they'll be leaders one day. They'll follow the rules of the IMF and they'll, you know, they'll fall in line with the capitalist system. But that's a whole different argument. But I think with the self orientalism and our own authors, sometimes they just dirt. Sometimes they just follow the, the party line and they just say what, what they have to say to get paid. And that journalism happens in the West too. So it doesn't really, doesn't really get, get much better. I think, I think that's just differences we have as, as people. Oh yeah. And, um, a lot of this, and I, th- I think a- as you guys probably said, is that a lot of um, a lot of um, people in the East they like internalize like a lot of Western ideals, whatever, and all that Orientalist stuff. I think a big example of this is um, in Bali, they pass like lighter skin people and they like promote like skin creams and and all this stuff to. And this is comes from like, you know, Colombia and like the British kind of imbued this idea that lighter skin is like better and everything. And this is you see this today. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's a, I think it's a problem a lot of Asian people recognize. It's something that's very inherent to the subcontinent, the fair skin idea. Yeah. Um, but that goes way back uh, before yeah. the British came, right? Yeah. The natives of India were Dravidian people who were darker skinned, and then most of the invaders who came in were lighter skinned, and that's something um, the British are par- partially responsible for. But I don't um, think it's right to, you know, put the full blame on them for that. No, we're um, blaming them for everything. I did tonight. have. Okay, go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did have another question um, about um, Orientalism in photography, but also about Orientalism in general. A, common question that is asked or a common rebuttal that is given is is that it's not just you know um the white people or the western people who think that they're superior everyone who comes in is a conqueror for instance the Mughals who came in um in india 
thought they were superior and they brought in the culture and they tried to you know make the locals more sophisticated and it's partially true too because when you read the tuske babu that's what they've discussed that their language is backward their uh, lifestyle is in you know very civilized and we've brought that or we brought all that uh, civilization to the subcontinent how do you you know um, go about that argument and how this is this is a this is a very really important you point you that that yeah you know, yeah this is a really important point and this is one of the largest critiques of edward said's work which is which is why does he only focus on the on the west why doesn't he focus on eastern empires um because quite you know similar problems happened um and and i think the answer is everybody does it right everybody does it but our experience in the last 500 years is is systematically catalog is catalog you know is catalog we know how they've done it we were the children of that so we can talk about it to talk about the, the racial superiority of the moguls or um you know the ottomans that's a whole yeah i mean they they represent them too but I, you know that's i think it's a very interesting topic you can have an entire hour conversation just on the difference between the mogul the ottomans the british the french and there's a lot of nuance to be discussed and the point is you're right you can't just blame the dutch or the germans or the british um this has happened this has happened throughout time in history um I just want to end this point and I'm I'm aware that we're really past the one hour mark. Um I just really quickly wanted to cover what's happening now in the world um and the COVID-19 situation and and the disturbing coverage has been getting in the press. So we won't take on this for too long but if you guys want we can expand it but you guys if you guys saw my story yesterday um I've I've just been really taken back by how we're continuously representing what's happening in our in our lands versus what's happening in the east and i just wanted to cuz your your thoughts on this do you guys feel like this is a growing issue or am i just really paranoid and i'm really reading into the news because sometimes i feel like i am um is china the bad guy or are we the bad i don't know who's the bad guy thoughts it depends on who you believe i mean you have you have you have press on one side saying that it's china's China is the result of this and then you have China on the other side saying the US is the cause of this and all this other stuff so it's like it's it, you have US propaganda you have Chinese propaganda and in the middle is truth so what yeah. do you believe I think I, I think the coronavirus has sort of tackled in a funny way a lot of societal issues that we had before um like collective action problems uh, you know poor not not paying you know your who deemed to be essential workers enough um you know too fast a pace of life um actually i i i really liked your media criticisms on yeah. your facebook post because i used to be a journalist so i'm also one of these people who you know sort of reads behind beyond the headlines and you know tries to look at bigger trends and i have to agree that like the coverage coming out of europe is just like oh and you know resilient european spirit see how they're clapping on the alkies every evening the health care workers and singing and playing music and whatever and you know then when it comes to us um you know it's just like death and oh my god you see they're burying bodies in mass graves and you know it's like the exact same things ha- happening in the west so why yeah. is it that it's so it's like a crime. it's it's a sign of like a system failing when iran is burying you know bodies yeah. in mass graves but you know in new york city they're burying they're burying them bodies. in the hundreds on islands and no one's yeah. talking about this and yeah. it's prison workers that are burying these bodies so it's really interesting it was perfect timing honestly when you started posting about this is when i started noticing it too cuz my parents watch the bbc they watch cnn and even though i don't live with them they send me pictures of everything and the contrast is it's baffling like it makes you so upset you just see all these dead bodies in like iran versus america where they're like oh so much hope like people are like caring for each other doctors are holding hands and it's that it's beautiful but it's like an american perspective and like you see the contrast and it's like well here we have these muslims again they're worship i do they not know any better like shit like that so like can i can yeah. i just point some things out so um so 100% agree with all the points saying this something else has been really bothering me, i think that we haven't or many people haven't like looked into is when the death toll started rising in iran it was like well of course 
well, you know, it was like, well, they're, it's like, they have terrible, though they treat their people so terribly, they don't have proper structures, systems in place. And like, of course, there's the numbers are going up so high. And it was almost like, the narrative was like, it was expected, expect, an expectation of countries who don't, who are not in the West, who have high numbers. And when it started happening here, all of a sudden the narrative changed to look how supportive we are with one another, look how much we're trying with one another. Um, another interesting thing though, in Canada, we recently opened up applications and um, encouraged um, uh, doctors from other countries country to come and practice here for a temporary um for a temporary uh, period of time and what really like you know boggles my mind is it's incredibly hard to have like you know outside of the corona pandemic is it's incredibly hard to um change to transfer your credentials from another country into canada where now that we're in a pandemic suddenly these people are validated and some of these people education are actually um of of, of, uh, of worthy so that's another thing that you know what i was thinking about recently like it's the way we think about the other side of the world pre-pandemic versus what use are they to us now during the pandemic is just so interesting you know and you know we're not even talking about the fact that in america the largest death toll is not the african americans like like this is a this is a race problem this is a class problem and i don't know like for me it's like you know we it's just like, expected the numbers like to be your, really bad it's like you, your uber driver is your doctor now because those guys have degrees back home but in the u.s yeah. and canada they're not um but exactly. this is the consequences is great because those people are needed in their home countries and we're sucking them yeah. dry we're saying come come to the yeah. west yeah now that we do i mean we we, we yeah. deem you worthy and yeah but well, it, a, lot, we, a lot of these uh, a lot of these people who have like issues with their like foreign accreditation end up becoming cabbies and like i don't know if you live in toronto but like that's how many cabs have you talked to? oh yeah i used to be an engineer back you know Uber oh, drivers yeah yeah engineers yeah. yeah doctors yeah and it's like you, you couldn't move your asses on this which has been a huge issue for a country that accepts as many immigrants as canada does like um, my, until this happens my <laughs> biggest thing is like just i mean we have so many doctors here who are having a hard time getting validated with their credentials why are we focusing on them <laughs> why are we asking them to come from other countries yeah yeah bar yeah. another weird thing i uh i I'm a public health student, so I've been reading a couple of different uh, epidemi uh, like ep epidemiologist takes on it. And one thing I think this is this is now my personal take is that in in other European countries, there's kind of like I feel like PC culture kind of got in the way of good health policies because it just be has become so politicized um, on its own, obviously insufficient, but. Uh, the Eastern countries did, and which America tried to do, obviously racially motivated, but also, but in the end, it was a, you know, paraded as a health policy, uh, has helped, especially in different Middle Eastern countries. But there's kind of like this liberal idea, like, oh, we can't talk about people superficially, like, you know, you just can't cross that line because if we cross that line, it'll expose the ways in which we consider different people. And this this one principle we hold is what is the only thing that gives these people any dignity and value is this one principle that we kind of hold on to. And I think it was re really weird how kind of the, the the PC culture got in the way of good health practices in some of these, especially European countries, because they couldn't find a way to do it without ruining an image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's there's a there's an interesting um, this is an interesting time because I think what happens in in crisis is you have a window open in which you see a lot of the prejudices coming out, um, and you can't hide them anymore. And I, and I think this is this is that time where you, I think someone said earlier, you're now seeing people that are invalid not becoming valid, and you're, you're thinking why. Um, the fact that you have Muslims being blamed for the virus in the UK and India, um, these are built on, you know, just just racist images. But now it's become almost acceptable to come out and just say this is this is who you guys are. Um, anyway, I, I think I think we probably end it there. I think. We could speak about this, I think, for for a while, but I just want to touch on that topic because I think as we read the news, just pay attention to the language that's being used. Um, you'll notice more and more that Iran is to blame, China is to blame. Um, although Sweden, did you guys see today? Sweden is now the fastest rising country with deaths in Nordic countries, and they haven't, they didn't even have a full quarantine. 
in place until a few days ago, the bars were open. Could you imagine like if someone else did this, they would be slaughtered saying, how could you be so irresponsible? So just, just realize how the split is now becoming very, very clear. Um, and just, just to end on one point, I have a friend on Instagram and I hope they don't listen to this because um, they, work, they work for the New York mayor's office and they messaged me saying, I think you misunderstood what's happening in the news. And I said, what do you mean? They said, we don't have mass graves in New York. And I said, well, what do you have? I can see them. They said, well, no, these are, because the morgues are so full, we're putting them in these places for 30 days. And if after 30 days, no one claims them, they'll be buried. And I said, well, I can see that. So what you're saying is these are temporary mass graves. So this justification happening, even, even when it's happening, we are in denial in the West that how can we have mass graves in New York? And firstly, Heart Island is New York City. It's not like, like in Jersey, it is New York. It might be an island, but it's still New York. So even when things are getting really bad, we're being told it's okay, it's not that bad. So on that, I wish all of you guys um, safety for you and your family, and I hope you guys take care of yourself. Um, stay safe, and so hopefully we'll, we can do something like this again if you guys enjoyed this. If you have, yeah, if yeah. You have, if you have suggestions for topics, message me, and, um, and inshallah we can do it. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Yeah, thank, you. No thank you. Questions. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Take care. All right.